A very good evening to one and all present here. I, Mayan Gupta, on behalf of the Executive Committee of Placement Assistant Council, would like to welcome Professor in Charge, Dr. Alka Chawla, ma'am, a guest for today's session, Professor Kamla Sankaran, ma'am, and our teacher convener, Rajita, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for accepting our invitation. Teachers play a pivotal role in students' life that transits academia. They also perform their part as navigators, role models, go-to person when in need of guidance and profound sources of encouragement. Though we cannot make the online teaching learning as comprehensive and fulfilling an experience as a conventional classroom setup, an attempt can be made to provide the students the opportunity from their professors on diverse issues. Hence, Placement Assistant Council has taken an initiative to present a series of interactive and informative sessions by our own CLC professors. These sessions will include lectures on areas of expertise of our professors, career advice, tips and tricks to deal with travels of law. We honestly believe that students will immensely benefit from these sessions as they will not only provide students an opportunity to interact with professors, but to also learn from their years of experience, observations and reflections. Learnings from this series will contribute to the holistic development of the students, assist them to carve out a career for themselves and help them in becoming not only a better professional, but a person as well. And in the spirit of continuing learning from the expert and their experiences, we have in the midst of us, Professor Dr. Kamla Sankaran Ma'am to address us on constitutional dimensions in litigation. Kamla Ma'am is currently a professor at the Campus Law Center, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. And she has been teaching constitutional law, jurisprudence and labor law. Her research interests include constitutional law, international labor standards and the regulation of work. Her recent book include Affirmative Action, A View from the Global South, and the Challenging Legal Boundaries of Work Regulation, Fudge, McChrystal, and Sankaran Editions from Hart Publishing, Oxford. Ma'am has previously served as the Vice Chancellor at Tamil Nadu National University at Tiruchupalli. She has been a fellow at Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Study in South Africa, visiting South Asian Research Fellow at School of Interdisciplinary Area Studies, at Oxford University and a visiting scholar and recipient of the Fulbright Postdoctoral Research Fellowship at the Georgetown University Law Center, Washington, D.C. Ma'am is a member International Advisory Board, International Journal of Comparative Labor Law and Industrial Relations. Ma'am has been a member editorial board, University of Oxford Human Rights Hub Journal. She was also a member at Editorial Advisory Board, Indian Journal of Labor Economics, and has served as the editor of the Daily Law Review. Mom has always been an inspiration for us. She has been very welcoming and gentle to all the students of CLC. I remember I have been not been a regular student of Mom, but got a chance to attend few classes of constitutional law. Thank you so much, Mom. So thankful to you, Kamla. Uh, you know, I don't want to treat you like a guest. We have all been working together for so long. This is our home. In fact, uh, we've studied here, we are teaching here. Uh, so I do not know whether to say welcome or just to say hi. That's all. Thank you so much for speaking to the students. That's all. Thank you. Over to Placement Assistance Council. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think we can join. First of all, uh, yes, a warm welcome because I just spoke to Alka ma'am and Alka ma'am was so enthusiastic and she's been so supportive over this initiative. Ma'am, I really thank you and I think all the students are extremely overwhelmed. And of course, Professor uh, Dr. Kamna Shankaran ma'am, I called her and she was like, sure, I would be very happy to interact with the students. So I think both your enthusiasm has been so nice and we are like i think for my end so i'm honored because i'm not even a du student so for me it would be very nice to listen to great uh stalwarts in the legal field like you so i think i'm very overwhelmed a lot of our faculty members are also joining so i just now had messages in in the faculty group also that uh, you know they're not able to join through this link so i shared the other link so i think uh, we are very happy all of us thank you so much ma'am for giving us this opportunity we once again welcome you and um, please take the session high. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very glad to be here with you all this evening as part of the series of Placement Assistant Council. I really thank my friend and colleague, Professor Alka Chawla, 
our professor in charge, Dr. Ruchita Chakravarti, other teacher members and student members of the pack for this invitation. You know, I had the good fortune, like Alka Ma'am was just mentioning, to be as a student here in CLC. And then and when I was a student here, I had the further good fortune of being taught constitutional law by Professor P.K. Tripathi, Professor M.P. Singh, Professor Bakshi, Professor Parmanan Singh. And about 10 years ago, for about five years, I was Dean Legal Affairs for this university. And in that capacity, I regularly interacted with several uh, in the, with Mr. P. P. Rao, who was himself once a teacher at Campus Law Center, and then of course was well known senior advocate of the Supreme Court, and because of his close relationship with CLC, he was the honorary senior counsel for the university in the Supreme Court, and so I've spent several hours with him settling. Uh, replies and developing arguments for uh, many lots of court cases that Delhi University had and continues to have. And I think at that time I realized the importance of strong grounding in legal doctrine and black letter law that Campus Law Center provided us with. And so this evening, I'd like to dedicate my talk to him and all my other teachers here, because I really think I'm a product of this institution and it's a matter of deep honor and privilege for me here this evening. Now, catering to the future career needs of a large student body, because I think this lecture is organized by PAC, Placement Assistance Council. So I'm keeping that focus in mind. So catering to the future and career needs of a large student body such as we have in Campus Law Center is a challenge. My own experience as a teacher here at CLC and also as a one-time convener of PAC, okay, long, long ago, indicates that many of our students pursue litigation after graduation. And a city like Delhi affords opportunities to practice in Supreme Court, High Court, several tribunals, commissions, etc. At the same time, for many of our students, the choice remains practice in subordinate courts, either located in Delhi or in other states. When I have been teaching all these years constitutional law, I often get asked this question whether this subject is, rel is of any relevance from a practice point of view, especially for a person who is going to practice in the subordinate courts. So really that was at the back of my mind when I decided that this evening I propose to address that question. I will focus on two broad points. One, does our judicial system allow us to raise constitutional issues at quote unquote the lower court level to what extent can one do so are there limits to the kind of constitutional questions one can raise in these courts and second addressing the same question but from a reverse perspective is it possible to raise questions that arise on what can broadly be termed non-constitutional grounds before the superior courts, so-called superior courts of the High Court and the Supreme Court. To what extent can one constitutionalize a non-constitutional question? What advantages does one get in constitutionalizing a question in the subordinate courts? or in the High Court or Supreme Court? Are there strategic litigation benefits of doing so? Let me address the questions in that very same order that I have placed it in front of you. The Constitution is often described as a Suprema Lex. It provides, as Kelsen would remind us, unity and validity to all norms within our legal system. It also performs the role of a scheme of interpretation for the norms in this entire legal order. Yet, the Indian Constitution is not merely a formal document, nor is it merely constitutive in the sense of providing coherence to the legal system or authorizing or permitting or validating 
positive laws created by constitutional institutions. It does something more. It also incorporates a concrete content to these norms. It's not just procedure, it also has content. And the framers of the Indian constitution, as evidenced in its preamble, made a very definitive choice, a pre-selection, if you will, that highlighted justice, social, economic, and political, as well as equality of status and opportunity, which were as important as liberty and fraternity. So I'd like to, you know, quoting Justice Beg, who uh, was one of the 13 judges in the Keshwan and the Bharti case, he stated, and I quote, I think it is clear from the preamble as well as the provisions of part three and part four of our constitution that it seeks to express this principle, salus populi supreme lex. In other words, the good of the mass of citizens of our country is the supreme law embodied in our constitution prefaced as it is by the preamble or the key which puts justice, social, economic and political as the first of the four objectives of the constitutions by means of which the people of India are constituted into a sovereign democratic republic, end quote. Thus the constitution performs this dual function of providing a foundation to the legal order as well as animating all norms within the system with a set of key elements of basic features which underpin each individual norm. Clearly, every law, every statute, every administrative rule, every private agreement between non-state actors would also then have to be interpreted and reviewed in the light of the constitutional scheme. In short, there is a constitutionalization of everyday life, which is a part of the transformation that the constitution seeks to achieve. There are, of course, various ways in which this term has been used. I use this term constitutionalization to indicate the political, social, and legal agenda of incorporating and imbuing not only the constitutional institutions with constitutional morality, but also horizontally, all interactions in civil societies and also all interactions among private persons. Even private interactions, contracts, relationships cannot stand outside this process of constitutionalization. The judiciary has the key role as the guardian of the constitution, the sentinel on the qui vive, as Chief Justice Patanjali Shastri so beautifully put it, to ensure that this constitutionalization proceeds unhindered. However, do all courts across India have this responsibility? There appears to be some division of labor in this task of monitoring the constitutionalization process allotted to the judiciary. Is the dichotomy between casting a constitutional interpretative role to the High Court and Supreme Court while excluding the subordinate courts, is that a correct reading of the Constitution? This expression, subordinate courts, is used in Chapter 6 of the Constitution that would, in light of Article 236, include courts headed by a district judge, sessions judge, an additional district or sessions judge, joint or assistant district or session judge, and all other civil judicial posts inferior to that of the post of the district or sessions judge. What does the, that then tell us about the question that I raised a short while ago? How relevant are constitutional principles while litigating in subordinate courts? and in dealing with non-constitutional matters in the Supreme Court and in the High Court. Let me begin with Article 228. It deals with the transfer of certain cases to the High Court. And it states, if the High Court is satisfied that a case pending in a court subordinate to it involves a substantial question of law, as to the interpretation of this constitution, the determination of which is necessary for the disposal of the case, it shall withdraw the case and may either dispose of the case itself 
or determine the said question of law and return the case to the court from which the case has been so withdrawn, etc., etc. In order to invoke Article 228 of the Constitution, the High Court must be satisfied that the case pending before a subordinate court involves a substantial question of law as to the interpretation of the Constitution. That's the phrase used. A substantial question of law as to the interpretation of the Constitution and that the determination of which is necessary for the disposal of the case before the subordinate court. Can a question which is already settled by the Supreme Court, one that is no longer race integra, can it be subject to Article 228? Or put, looking at it in another way, if the matter has already been settled, in the sense of a final interpretation of a question has already been raised and settled by the Supreme Court, then we know that under Article 141, the law declared by the court is bind, Supreme Court, excuse me, is binding on all courts within the territory of India, including, of course, the subordinate court. There would then be no occasion for Article 228 to operate. In that sense, either Article 141 would operate or else Article 228, both cannot stand together. There is a, dis moving further, there is a distinction between a substantial question of law and a substantial question of law to the interpretation of the Constitution. I just want to now dwell a little bit on this. The phrase substantial question of law as to the interpretation of the Constitution is found not only in Article 228, it's to be found elsewhere in the Constitution also. While dealing with the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, for instance, in Article 132, and Article 133, which deals with appeals as of right to the Supreme Court, where a certificate to that effect has been provided by the High Court. There is use of this phrase. It is also useful to recall that Article 145, subclause 3, which deals with the rulemaking power of the Supreme Court, states inter alia that the maximum number of judges who are to sit for the purpose of deciding any case involving a substantial question of law as to the interpretation of this constitution, it goes on to say in other things, shall be five. Article 147 states that reference to any substantial question of law as to the interpretation of this constitution would also be deemed to, should be construed as including references to substantial questions of law that arose under Government of India Act 1935, uh, Indian Independence Act, etc. And et there are also provisions in the CRPC and CPC where a subordinate court may of its own refer to the High Court any question that is before it where the validity of a law is challenged. So 228 is of course dealing with the High Court withdraws itself. Now I want to just have a quick look at CPC and CRPC. If you look at section 113 of the Code of Civil Procedure, CPC, it requires a district court to refer a matter to the opinion of the High Court if it is satisfied that the case pending before it involves a question as to the validity of any act, ordinance, regulation, or any provision contained in any act, ordinance, or regulation, the determination of which is necessary for the disposal of the case. And the court, that subordinate court, is of the opinion that such act, ordinance, regulation, or provision is invalid or inoperative, but has not been so declared by the High Court to which the court is subordinate. Now look at 113 one carefully. If a question is pending before the subordinate court, where the validity of an act, for example, is under challenge, on the initiative of the district court, which under Article 236 will involve all civil court, junior division, see, all of them, back to the high court but there's another limb to it and it is of the opinion that this act is invalid but it has not been so declared by the high court by or by the supreme court 
So notwithstanding the view of that district court, because there is no binding precedent of the High Court or the Supreme Court, you would once again require it to be referred to the High Court. So you will see in 113, the, the initiative for referral coming from the district court. So it's not only top down, it's bottom up. And you will also see in built in it the doctrine of precedent that notwithstanding the view taken by the district court, even if it is of the opinion that it is invalid, because there is no binding precedent, which clearly indicates that a holding of constitutionality flows top down. Reference to the question may flow bottom up, but the answer flows top down. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. Let's see if I have time to pick up that point again. And if you go further into Rule 1 of Order 27A of the CPC, it says, and I'm just quoting again, in any suit in which it appears to the court that any such question as is referred to in Clause 1 of Article 132, read with Article 147 of the Constitution is involved. That is a substantial question of law as to the interpretation of the Constitution. The court shall not proceed to determine that question until after notice has been given to the Attorney General of India if the question of law concerns the central government and to the Advocate General of the state if the question of law concerns the state government. So it really depends on whether it is a law made by parliament or whether it is a law made by the state government. And you have the question of the seventh schedule there. And if it is a constitutionality of a state law, advocate general, else the attorney general. Notice has to be given. So clearly, the highest law officer of the union or the state needs to be given a notice for addressing the court on the issue of a substantial question of law as to the interpretation of the constitution. And who does this? This is a court which is dealing with this matter, including a subordinate court. So there is an opportunity to raise it. The notice is issued and then, of course, as we know, it is referred up Alternatively, it could be withdrawn by the High Court. There's a similar provision in the CRPC. So I just like to draw your attention to section 395 of the CRPC, which reads as follows, reference to the High Court. That's what the marginal note says. Where any court is satisfied that a case pending before it involves a question as to the validity of any act or ordinance or to any provision contained in such an act or and the determination of which is necessary for the disposal of the case. Look at these two limbs, very similar to CPC. I didn't say it there, I wanted to say it here. One is the validity of the law or the interpretation of a provision which is necessary for determining the dispute which is there before the court under the CRPC. So it's not only validity of the law, it's also an interpretation. And both of which are subsumed by that constitutional phrase, substantial question as to the interpretation of the constitution. Both the validity question as well as statutory interpretation or constitutional interpretation would be be contained in these two limbs and I just read it out again so that you're able to just hear this point. I'm sorry, I don't have a, I'm not sharing my screen. Where any court is satisfied that a case pending before it involves a question as to the validity of any act or any provision contained in any act, the determination of which is necessary for the disposal of the case. So it deals both with judicial review in terms of constitutional limits as well as interpretation. Both are there contained both in 113 Rule 1 of 27A of the CPC as well as 395. And lastly, but which has not been so declared by the High Court to which that court is subordinate or the Supreme Court. Please note the subordinate court has only the binding precedental value of the High Court that it takes notes of persuasive precedental value of other high courts is not to be taken into account by the either the CRPC or the CPC provision. So you can see that distinction in these between the binding precedental value of the high court towards its own subordinate courts and the lack of any persuasive value 
with regard to this provision that you see here. And therefore, if these things happen under 395, the same shall be referred for the decision of the High Court. There are other provisions in 395. I'm not going into it. Now, this phrase, substantial question of law, has been interpreted by the Privy Council itself. And it has been drawn upon by the courts. That's quite interesting because the Privy Council is, of course, a pre-constitutional institution. Should I look at a Privy Council judgment to interpret what is meant by substantial question of law as to the interpretation of the Constitution? And you get the link actually from Article 147, which says that while interpreting substantial question of law, you can also look at Government of India Act 1935 and the Indian Independence Act 1947. So because of Article 147, there is the ability for us to draw on the Privy Council and its interpretation of substantial question of law. Of course, the, the latter half of the phrase, phrase as to the provisions of the Constitution is missing, but still. So, for example, in an early 1927 case of the Privy Council, Raghunath Prasad Singh versus Deputy Commissioner of Pratap Gad, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the JCPC, observed that a question of, of law can be considered to be a substantial question of law. And for that, it could be, it did not only be of general importance, but it could also be a substantial question as between the parties. So it need not have cascading effects outside the dispute and the two parties in front of it. Notwithstanding that, it would still be a substantial question of law. So the generality of the question of law is not relevant. What is relevant is whether it's substantive or not. That's really what the Privy Council said. I move on to this was quoted with approval by the Supreme Court in 1962. Sir Chunilal V. Mehta versus Century Spinning and Manufacturing Company Limited. And look at what the Supreme Court says. You know, I, I'm on this little narrow point about the relevance of pre-constitutional court decisions for interpreting this particular phrase. And the court said that the proper test for determining whether a question of law raised in a case is substantial would, in our opinion, be whether it is of general public importance of whether it is direct or whether it is directly or substantially affecting the rights of the parties and if so whether it is an open question in the sense that it is not finally settled by this court or by the privy council or the federal court or is not free from difficulty or calls for discussion or alternative views that is it could be both a general question or it could be just an issue inter partes okay if the question is settled by the highest court or the general principles to be applied in determining the question are well settled and there is a mere question of applying those principles or the plea raised is palpably observed, the question would not be a substantial question of law. So here you have what exactly it should be, no longer be res integra. It should be relevant and substantial between the parties and it could also have general consequences. But that's not necessary always. One can also distinguish between a question of law and a substantial question of law. Okay, And I'm really not speaking hence here. There is a distinction between a question of law and a substantial question of law. And this di a difference has great relevance when we look to questions that can be raised in regular first appeals and regular second appeals. For example, the Supreme Court rather recently in 2006 in a case called Hero Vinod Minor versus Seshamal noted that the question of law raised will not be considered a substantial question of law if it stands already decided by a larger bench of the High Court concerned or by the Privy Council or the Federal Court or a Supreme Court where the facts required for a point of law have not been pleaded. So first, there is a question of law, but whether it's substantial or not is determined by whether there is a precedent, a binding precedent on the point. Second, where the facts required for a point of law have not been pleaded, 
a litigant should not be allowed to raise that question as a substantial question of law in second appeal. And this is a very important point for anybody who is going to be a future lawyer or a judge. There is the constructive res judicata principle that if you are pleadings are not complete in the first instance and a point of law has not been raised, then subsequently in the RSA, regular second appeal, there is no way you can raise that question. And this is a point that I think all of you who are present here today are probably, uh, I don't know which year you are in, but probably have already. Therefore, the mere appreciation of facts or the documentary evidence or the meaning of entries or the content of documents cannot be held to be raising a substantial question of law. They can raise a question of law, sure, but they don't raise a substantial question of law. Therefore, to conclude this part of our discussion, constitutional principles and matters of judicial review can be raised in subordinate court. Yet their determination may require their withdrawal before the High Court or their reference to the High Court depending on whether the initiative comes from the High Court or the subordinate court. The Supreme Court will not be seized of the matter in the first instance either under the CPC, CRPC or under Article 228. The root of constitutionalization, the question whether a list or a dispute before the judicial body requires a constitutional interpretation is therefore done at the behest of the courts under these provisions that we just looked at. Turning now to the second question that I wish to discuss this evening. How am I for time? Can I continue? Yes, ma'am, you can continue. <laughs> Turning now to the second question that I wish to discuss this evening. Can a litigant constitutionalize a question directly before the highest court? Because earlier I was talking to you about subordinate court and high court. Can you constitutionalize a question directly before the higher court, highest court? Can the interpretation of an ordinary statute or rules made thereunder, can these be treated as a constitutional matter? Let me begin with the leading Supreme Court judgment in Sunil Batra case. Sunil Batra versus Delhi administration decided on 30th August 1978. In Sunil Batra, Justice V. R. Krishnaya of the Supreme Court was examining Rule 3, which states that all visitors to the prison under the prison rules, which states that all visitors to the prison shall have the opportunity of observing the state of jail, its management, and every prisoner confined therein. Just as V.R. Krishna noted that the duties of the official visitors includes satisfying themselves that the provisions of the Prisons Act and prison rules, regulations, orders, and directions are duly observed. And he observed that these rules are pregnant with possibilities. And he went on to state and I'm quoting him, we read humane amplitude into this group of rules so as to constitutionalize the statutory prescriptions. They spell out a duty on the part of visitors and the IG of prisons to hear appeals or complaints from the prisoners regarding irons forced on them. You know, Sunil Batra? <laughs> I request all the students to please mute yourselves. Let ma'am speak. Kindly check your microphones and please mute. I'm so sorry, ma'am. So, they, you know, the court was looking into whether this rule could be constitutionalized. And they went. he went on, Justice Krishna went on to note that there's a duty on the part of the visitors and IG of prisons to hear appeals or complaints from prisoners regarding irons imposed on them. They were in fetters, right? And the reasonableness of the restriction being the constitutional badge, the only way we can sustain uh, Section 56 of the Prisons Act is to imply that the broad group of provisions requires immediate review and cutting short of the iron regime to the briefest spell. Okay, so that fettering will be for the shortest period. Now, he used this word for the first time, constitutionalizing a right which others have gone on to use. But really, this is the first time that it was used. And he therefore said that this the, the validity of this would be tested on the anvil of 
constitutional provisions, but not just its validity, its interpretation would also be colored by the constitutional prism. So as the Supreme Court put it, even visitors to prisons had a constitutional duty or what we could also call constitutional morality to interpret the rule in light of constitutional principles. Moving further, I'm going to take up three cases before I conclude. In perhaps the first case where a letter was converted into a writ petition, and this really the first case would be in 1980, Gopalanachari Gopalana versus State of Kerala. And in this case, again, Justice Krishnayar was discussing section 110 of the CRPC, which allows a magistrate to order a bond of security for good behavior from a habitual offender. And what the court was doing was whether the interpretation to section 110 of the CRPC, what would it look like if it were interpreted in the light of a constitutional scheme? And uh, as I told you, this was a letter that was converted to the writ petition. Of course, Bandhuva Mukti Mocha followed later in 83, but really the first, uh, you know, epistolary jurisdiction, if you will, was this. And what the court, Justice Krishna had pointed out was that the constitutional survival of Section 110 certainly depends on its obedience to Article 21. And it said that if you look at Article uh, Section 110 of the CRPC, it says that people who, and I'm quoting A to G, look at the phrases, I think you will understand what the court is trying to mean. Those who by habit is a robber by habit a receiver of stolen property, habitually protects or harbors thieves, habitually commits or attempts to commit or abate the commission of, is so desperate and dangerous as to render his being at large within without security hazardous to the community. The court stated, and I'm quoting, excuse me, these expressions when they become part of the preventive chapter with potential for deprivation of a man's potential freedom for up to a period of three years must be scrutinized by the court closely and anxiously. The poor are picked up or brought up Habitual witnesses swear away their freedoms and courts ritualistically commit them to prison. And Article 21 for them is a freedom under total eclipse in practice. Courts are guardians of human rights. The common man looks upon the trial court as the protector. The poor and illiterate who have hardly the capability of defending themselves are nevertheless not non-persons that trial judges must remember. And therefore, he went on to say that the trial judge before whom 110 matters come must not look at these categories A to G of section 110 mechanically, but must look at it with the constitutional perspective in mind. And I continue with one more example. The classic Bandhua Mukti Morcha case decided in 1983. Here was a letter written once again, a letter written by bonded laborers working in Bhatti mines just here in Faridabad in Delhi to the Chief Justice, at that time Chief Justice Bhagwati, stating that their rights under certain laws are not being enforced. Justice Bhagwati uh, it was Justice Bhagavati at that time, are not being enforced. The laws in question, they stated that statutory laws are not being enforced. Please note, they write a letter saying different laws are not being enforced. I want us to appreciate how that constitutionalization of statutes happened. The letter stated that the Interstate Migrant Workman Regulation of Employment and Condition Service Act 1979 the Contract Labor Regulation and Abolition Act 1970, the Bonded Labor System Abolition Act 1976, the Minimum Wages Act 1948, Workmen's Compensation Act 1923. At that time, it was not employees. It was still Workmen's Compensation Act. Payment of Wages Act 1936, Employee State Insurance Act 19. 48, Maternity Benefit Act 1961, eight acts which are applicable to these workers working in these said mines was not being enforced. And as Justice Bhagwati put it, these are victims of the most inhuman exploitation. Now, the question before the court here was, should the enforcement 
or the violation of a statute not be challenged under the authorities prescribed under each law. That is, if you have a minimum wage act infraction, you have to file an application before the you know the appropriate authority there how can this be constitutionalized and brought before the supreme court so there was this entry level jurisdictional hurdle that the court had to go through before it could treat this as an article 32 petition and already in the early celebrated asia workers case people's union for democratic rights versus Union of India, the court, once again under Justice P. N. Bhagwati, had made the critical link between violation of minimum wages under the Minimum Wages Act 1948 and forced labor under Article 23 of the Constitution. He had stated, it may therefore be legitimately presumed that when a person provides labor or service to another against receipt of remuneration, which is less than minimum wage, he is acting under the force of some compulsion, which drives him to work, though he is paid less than what he is entitled to, to receive. Therefore, in the Asia case and the subsequent Bandhua Mukti Mocha case two years later, the creative craftsmanship of Justice Bhagwati made the link between non-payment of minimum wages and violation of a statutory right and the denial of a fundamental right and therefore opened up the jurisdiction of the court to what would otherwise have been seen as a mere violation of a statutory right for which the only recourse would have been the authority set up under the Minimum Wages Act 1948 or the other relevant statutes. Broadening the right against exploitation to include non-enforcement of welfare measures or non-enforcement of statutes has allowed us to turn a statutory violation into a constitutional one and thus has allowed the invocation of either Article 32 or 226 but other techniques of constitutionalization have also been used. Our alumni and well-known Supreme Court senior advocate, Mr. Raju Ramachandran, wrote in the early 80s of the new remedy of a constitutional tort that has emerged from the Supreme Court case of Rudalsa. Other people have used it, but seriously, the first person who used that phrase was Mr. Ramachandran. You can look at others who have used it, but here it is. This, of course, has grown into PIL jurisprudence where the restricted writ court by interpreting the expression power to issue directions or orders or writs, which occurs in Article 32, had permitted the granting of remedies far beyond that which a writ court in England with the power to issue high prerogative writs could have done. Not merely the power to quash and leave the parties to seek their remedies based on facts of the case or merits of the case elsewhere. But now the writ court, following Rudalsa, can order payment of compensation in writ proceedings. The phrase that has begun to be used, constitutional court, captures this blending of the power of a writ court alongside that of a court dealing with payment of unliquidated damages as compensation for tort, which would be in a normal suit. The blending of that suit remedy with the writ remedy gives us this constitutional tort. In addition, the court has in several subsequent cases exercised its power to order medical treatment, order police protection, compliance, etc. Further, the court has expanded its constitutionalization process through the technique of a continuing mandamus. By the appointment of a court appointed commissioner or an amicus curiae, to regularly take on the monitoring of the case and not leave it to the executive to implement. That is once again a constitutionalization that we see. Let me now just draw all these strands together so that I can conclude. What these cases specifically heralded was the power of the court to constitutionalize a matter and allow for what is called the constitutionalization of rights. What it does is to allow the litigant and the lawyer to present their statutory rights in constitutional terms. 
and perhaps obtain a quicker and more inexpensive remedy compared to pursuing the remedy under the statutory remedies available. Of course, overlaps between the statutory rights and constitutional rights, the interpretive enlargement of fundamental rights and the judicial craftsmanship allow for the new spaces and remedies to emerge. Yet, there are also limits to such expansion. New limits flow from the person using, now limits flow from the person using such expanded remedies. Public interested litigation and not publicity interested litigation, as Justice Bhagwati stingingly commented. Deprivation of jobs or denial of rights while in service cannot be now presented as a violation of Article 21 because now the courts have indicated that service matters cannot be brought before the courts in writ proceedings but must be pursued along the avenues available under statute. Other limits flowing from using Article 32 and 226, the principles akin to res judicata in such constitutional litigation also provide another set of limits. I don't have time to elaborate, but I just in telegraphic form have mentioned some of these limits. Notwithstanding all these limits, there is no doubt that to borrow and modify the felicitous phrase of Justice Holmes of the U.S. Supreme Court, the brooding omnipresence of the Constitution guides every normative interpretation and application in the country. The constitutionalization of every aspect of life and therefore of every litigation in the country is now here to stay. The challenge before law students who are our future lawyers, our future judges, our future legal professionals is to make it the constitutional morality of our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Now we may ask the students if they have some questions. I'm leaving others apart. I do have a few questions, ma'am. So that we would like you to answer. Um, mostly we see, ma'am, the cases around fundamental rights. The part three of the constitution of india covers the most litigation in supreme court or maybe the high court but ma'am we believe that there is something you know wider than the scope of part three which takes a major part of the constitutional litigation if you could brief us about the other parts which may include constitutional litigation okay thank you for that question just a quick comment on your question before i answer it Actually, if you look at the docket of the Supreme Court, I don't think Article 36, 32 cases account for the bulk of the cases before the Supreme Court. No. Bulk of them are actually 136 appeals which come from statute. So that in itself is, of course, a first answer to your question. It's not as if precious time is being taken up by part 32 in the facts don't so i would urge maybe students would like to look to see there is the report of the supreme court that comes out each year which you can mine for various information such as this other people have mined it but you are also free to do that data mining and pull it out so i don't think that that third part three of the constitution important as it is to my mind is not coming before the courts as often as it ought to. Because truly, if that is so important, it should occupy a lot of time before the High Court and Supreme Court. But the clogging up of the docket doesn't come from this. So I think that itself is my sort of quick answer to your question. Number two, if I can just elaborate a little more, our court is not only a constitutional court, it's also the appellate court. Okay. So we have all these jurisdictions before the Supreme Court. Because of that, it is also dealing with a large number of appeals that come from 32 or from statute, which has made the Supreme Court the highest appellate court. 
and it therefore has an opportunity both to speak to the interpretation of the constitution as well as the interpretation of statute you know there's this debate currently about whether we need a separate constitutional court and a supreme court which only performs this appellate function of interpreting statutes and other related matters okay at this point in time our court performs both functions it's both the constitutional court and it's also the highest court and there is merit in both these jurisdictions this is not to say that there is not merit to the argument i believe you know, the highest law officers also made this point about should we you know should we have a a, a a constitutional court but i think that there are links between interpreting the constitution and interpreting the statute so when the judges are talking about using a statute to constitutionalize it it's a bridge between these two realms notwithstanding the fact that the court is the highest court it, it's not as if it's in any way different from the statute they are all part of the same coherent legal order i began by talking about the role and place of the constitution in ensuring coherence and unity and structure to the entire legal system and that is a very strong argument in my mind for why the court must be concerned with both aspects i think i'll stop here thank you thank you so much ma'am is there anyone who wants to ask a question yes excuse me ma'am i have a question yeah yeah sure ma'am actually my question is related to the amendment to rule 6 of the deputation of cadre officers of the ias rules uh, rules 54 <laughs> okay such a specific question i'm not sure i can answer but it is such a okay but please go ahead please go ahead Ma'am, actually, the recent amendment has proposed by the central government. Ah, okay, government. okay, okay. About the cadre, yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay, ma'am. Yeah, okay. That's your question. No, ma'am. Hmm. Actually, my question is: the don't you think the center is uh, uh, weaponizing their uh, agents yes. in the states? Okay, I'm yeah. Just the, like, true, true. I'm true. just like uh, a secretary or principal secretary of or chief minister can be uh, called by the center. on central deputation so i think it's i think it's a uh, uh, undermining of the federalism of our country okay yes yeah that's a good question so let me sort of address it in the following manner you know this question of our center state relationships has always been a difficult one we don't have a strict federalism you know we have quasi federalism pragmatic federalism cooperative federalism there are any number of terms that those of you who are students of second year will be familiar with now the final compromise as arrived at gives us something peculiar in the form for example let me take article 256 okay if you were to just look at article 256 i'm just looking at it because i want to uh, Make a specific point. It says that the executive power of every state shall be so exercised to ensure compliance with the laws made by Parliament. So the duty to implement the law made by Parliament is cast also on the state administration. Now the All India Services are a strange midway device, which is that the controlling office is the central government dopt is the controlling office it's the appointing authority it's also the dismissing authority it's also the disciplinary authority yet the reason for an all india service is that they are deployed everywhere and it draws from the old ics where the ics was the steel frame that sort of kept up the british rule in india right and after the independence the all india services are in the same position where they are deputed to or you know you are allotted your cadre and the cadre is of course the state government and then the state government can make use of you but they don't appoint you they are not your disciplinary authority nor are they your dismissing authority so we have this very peculiar situation 
that under the state government are all the IAS officers, but who cannot be either appointed or so. If you look at, for example, the General Clauses Act, it tells you that the disciplinary authority is the person who is the appointing authority as well as the dismissing authority. That you know, that's used to interpret these rules that you are talking about. And it has always been, it's not a new debate, it's an old debate. And why do I say it's an old debate? It's sometimes history is useful for us to look at and to draw lessons from. So in the Sarkaria Commission report, which is the important 1984 commission report on center state relations, and it had been set up by the, I think Madam Indira Gandhi was the prime minister and it gave it report in 1984, uh, headed by Justice Sarkaria, who had been a judge of the Supreme Court. Some state governments had written very strong petitions to the Sarkaria Commission, Tamil Nadu was one of them, saying that these IAS people must be brought under the control of the state government for the duration that they are appointed. Because they take up a cadre, they train in the state, they serve in the state, but appointing and dismissal authority is with the center. And there is this anomaly. And Sarkaria Commission talked about various anti-federal features. They were talking about president's rule, but they also talked about this, you know, 256. How do you implement? Now, in a collaborative or cooperative federal scheme, and I think that that's the scheme that we have in India, it is not a single person's view that will prevail. And it's a question of politics and not of legality at this point. It's a question of politics that you have to allow both the state and the center, they stay about how deployment of administrative start will go. So in response to your very specific question about the recent controversy, its solution can only be found in political adjustment. And that is true of so many constitutional provisions. It cannot be found only in mere legal interpretation. Right now, the amendment requires doing away with the prior permission before a transfer order is made, right? That's really how it is. The amendment is sought to be done. And the prior permission is an acknowledgement that since they are allotted to a cadre, the state government also is in some sense having a say, even though in terms of service jurisprudence, it is neither the appointing authority nor the disciplinary nor the dismissing authority. So I think that it can only be done by, and look at the different other constitutional bodies. You have an interstate council. Yeah, it's a constitutional body which is supposed to meet regularly and it is supposed to uh, deal with federal matters and federal problems of such a nature. So I think it's in those areas that really an uh, answer can be found. Mom, we have another question in the chat box. Yeah. Can one also rely on Privy Council decision prior to 1935 for determination of whether a question of law can be taken as substantial? Yeah, I think I addressed that point and I would like this, whoever asked that question to have a look at Article 147. 147 is telling us about how we interpret this question of substantial question. And it says that it could include references to interpretation of Government of India Act 35. Now, at that, when you are looking at the interpretation of Government of India Act 1935, it stands to reason that we would be looking at the interpretation of Government of India Act as interpreted by the Privy Council. Now, that together with the expression in Article 13, as well as Article 372 dealing with laws and force, has allowed the continuation of the precedental value of Privy Council judgments unless it is overruled by, uh, I don't have time to go into detail in this reply, but if you were to read Article 13 read with Article 372, 
that interpretation of the privy council where it is relevant and unless it has been overruled by any constitutional provision or subsequent interpretation is followed so in fact in constitutional law there are so many places where we look at privy council decisions because the phrase used in the government of india act is identical to the phrase used in the constitution so take for example article 246 and what actually would be the meaning of you know the interpretation of the pith and substance rule for example we are looking at specific provisions under article 246 and because the language is very similar to that are identical actually to that under the government of india act that's the way and the question of substantial question of law is also one that is used in the government of india act and therefore we follow it that's the answer to cancel that i would like to give thank you for the answer ma'am actually the question was in regard to the privy council decisions prior to 1935 which is why which is what the confusion was and my answer also is addressing the same point mayank that the prior to 1947 the privy council is interpreting the government of india act 1935 the example i gave of pith and substance is exactly the same because the phrase used in the government of india act 1935 is identical to the phrase used in constitution now the courts have always looked at those privy council decisions to interpret even the phrase used here all right thank you ma'am thank you sir yeah ma'am can i ask one question yeah sure i don't know what are uh, yeah please go ahead okay hey, ma'am i'll pursue with my question since we talk about the precedents right so i want to ask whether high courts can overturn the judgments of supreme court for instance uh, the nowra days this marital case is going on in delhi high court there has we already have judgment on it uh, by the supreme court in 2019 that marital uh, marital rape aren't a crime right ma'am so can a delhi high court overturn its judgment and will it be impure see uh, will it be or not if they overturn it you know you are a student of law and you well understand the practice of distinguishing a case so this matter which is now being argued i know it's the news is full of it but to just answer your question in a general way not specific to this particular case of marital rape often times what is the ratio of the case is culled out by subsequent judgments and while the facts of a case may deal with a particular matter the ratio of the case must be confined to a particular matter so even in the marital rape issue how you read it and how the ratio is culled out is the critical point so if i'm not talking now about marital rape please read it i think there's a comment already that you must read it once again but whatever be the matter if i want to distinguish a particular supreme court judgment then i will have to conclude that while the decision dealt with larger matters the actual ratio was confined to a narrow point and as a student of law you will appreciate the distinction between the decision which disposes of all the facts in dispute in the case and the ratio which is the principle of law on the basis of which that decision got taken the ratio is a narrow point if a subsequent court and court lower court like a high court though it's not correct for us to use this expression at all if a high court even though there is a supreme court judgment on the point and notwithstanding article 141 that the law declared by the supreme court is binding on all courts including the high court in this instance if the high court can distinguish that case and say that the ratio did not pertain right. to this Bye. point there is no problem but i think somebody else wants to say something on the point so just to come back to the point that i think aisha you are talking about the question is not whether you are bound by the precedent or not i think that's too broad what the question really is a more nuanced point 
has the high court or will the high court be able to distinguish the ratio of the supreme court case which would still allow it an area which is still an open legal question which is still res integra meaning it is still open for arguments and decision over which it can then decide that will become the crucial point and i think it's very important how we read the ratio of the judgment and to confine it truly to the narrow legal point and not as something which covers the entire decision thank you so much ma'am um, i think we can have the last question for today's session we have your permission Sure. Ma'am, the question is, ma'am, for a young junior, it's important to have groundings in various of the law, various fields of the law, and if someone wants to pursue a career in pure constitutional practice, so what what do you will suggest or advise to that young lawyer to begin from, from a high court chamber, or from a supreme court chamber, or as we say that one who wants to practice should always begin their career from district courts it's a very difficult question but one that really concerns a lot of our students i agree there are so many different questions that factors that go into it where you live what your personal circumstances are so i'd be very reluctant to give a, a sort of an you know advice on a matter like this even if one is practicing in the supreme court and even if one is handling constitutional matters there's a great advantage in having also experience in a lower trial court because remember that even if the matter goes in appeal or even if the matter goes as a direct writ petition to the supreme court whichever route you are confronting a case questions of <coughs> evidence questions of relevancy and admissibility of facts will not be coming before you directly because it will not be you will only be appreciating the evidence in a secondary way those things would not you would not know often times it's only by practice and by handling matters that even in the supreme court you would be able to develop sets of arguments so even if you were drafting a a petition for a senior the grounds of challenge often times are drawn from the paper book the record of the lower court on the basis of which that appeal is being filed and your familiarity with the record of case of the court case coming from the trial court let's say it went to a single judge in the high court then it went to a letters patent appeal and now it's come after a review it has then come to the supreme court it could have gone through four stages that entire record to understand where exactly you would like to focus your grounds would require that you must be completely familiar with the procedure that has been adopted in the trial court in the court of first instance and that is something that comes with low court practice however whether you have the circumstance to do that whether for whatever reasons you are going to be in a high court that is of course personal to you but even if you are unable to do that even if you are unable to do that there are so many other ways even when you are right now interning and i tell this to students all the time even when you are now interning whether in a lower court whether in a high court whether in a law firm wherever pick up that paper book and the record and read it read it fully you know um, i told you i many years ago i did a stint as convener of placement assistant council and i used to ask students like what did you do during your internship oh ma'am we were photocopying paper very good there's a lot of learning in filing because going and doing pagination very important and but you must also use that opportunity to read and study look at the if there's a cross examination that is going on if there are filings of documents what document was done how was that document proved your study of evidence act is absolutely critical 
how did that happen how did the cross examination how was it recorded on what points was the challenge taken in the regular first appeal from regular first appeal how did it go to rsa those points of practice my learning both as an academic teacher and then about so many years done as uh, in looking at some litigation has pointed out to me that procedure is absolutely important absolutely important and therefore i think that whatever opportunity comes your way grab it make so full much. use of your internship make full use you go into your internship with an agenda don't wait for what the senior will tell you to do and then twiddle your thumbs and say aaj kuch nahi hua no that's not the way you know clc you get your opportunities you make the most of it you go out with your agenda in life and then you will find that it's far more enriching thank you so much ma'am i think this is something which all the students are missing due to the pandemic they are not been able to you know learn the insights and which what are the things they actually need to do one can study one can attend online course and one can also go through the judgments but practical experiences and the guidance from mentors matter a lot ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you so much ma'am um, i hope there are no more questions so i would like to invite uh, our teacher and convener uh, ruchita ma'am to present the vote of thanks um uh, first of all ma'am uh, i i would like to thank you from i mean uh, i have never attended your sessions before and it was only that i've always heard you are a stalwart in constitutional law so for me it was a very enriching session i i really loved listening to you and uh, uh, yeah of course and i think for uh, the students also it's a very very interesting experience for all of us here so ma'am first of all my greatest uh, my deepest thanks to you for accepting our invitation for agreeing to come and interact with the students and i think i must mention to you ma'am here that the students were so enthusiastic today we were using two links and the both the links were full so we had 200 students we also had team pack also had requests for a third link and uh, that was when we said that we can put it up online so that you know all the students in field we can benefit so this itself goes on to show ma'am that how important uh, to this session has been for all of us so ma'am thank you uh, for uh, whatever uh, you have spoken it's extremely enlightening it's my total pleasure to be here this evening after all clc is mine too and so thanks to you thanks to mayank thanks to pack thanks to alka ma'am and uh, thanks to all the students who are here you know a teacher is nothing without the students so i really uh, love and appreciate all our students here whom i really consider are one of the brightest in the country and my best wishes to a very good and bright future to all of you and thank you once again for this chance and good evening to all of you thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am i would also uh, before we end the program i would officially also like to definitely thank our uh, uh, you know dear professor dr alka chawla ma'am ma'am has been extremely supportive and uh, she has uh, since the time she took up as the professor in charge whenever i tell her anything she's always very open to new ideas so this was also an idea that we conceived as a team and then just pitched to and she was like yes we must definitely do it the idea basically was uh, that you know all the students there are so many students we have a huge number of students who pass out from clc and in the 3 years unfortunately they are unable to sit through any of the classes of people like you or alka ma'am or maybe raman sir usha ma'am all the gunjan ma'am all the professors that we have so this initiative was actually targeting that that you know we can cater at least uh, such stalwarts like you you can access more students of the clc so this was one of the initiatives and i really deeply thank our professor in charge anka chawla ma'am for giving us this opportunity uh, of course i would also like to thank the clc office because uh, nothing is possible without them although we are doing it in the online mode but of course the clc office has been of great help uh, i would like to definitely thank all the students their zealous and enthusiastic involvement in the program is really very very uh, you know motivating for us as well so your uh, participation makes any program a success so thank you very much all the participants for being here 
and finally of course i would like to thank all the you know few students a bunch of students who uh, work in the team pack as volunteers so the pack members thank you so much a lot of hard work goes behind a research program that we arrange and these students are extremely enthusiastic towards this so thank you team and of course ma'am once again i wish good evening to all of you and it was a wonderful session very nice being here thank you thank you thank you thank you ma'am